Howdy folks, welcome back to Mingles with Jingles. You ask, I pretend to answer <laughs> while just burbling on about random rubbish for half an hour. Uh, cracking on with the first question, it's from Leftus Deuces. He wants to know, where does the name Bohemian Eagle come from? This is actually a really popular question. It seems to pop up in one form or another in almost every video I upload. Uh, and it's usually asked by people who come from the Czech Republic, obviously because Bohemia is in the Czech Republic. Now, as gamers, most people um, don't know an awful lot about Bohemia or the Czech Republic, unless you played Operation Flashpoint or the Armed Assault series of games, which were developed by Bohemia Interactive. Uh, and that is pretty much the only experience anybody has of uh, Czechoslovakia, although it's not Czechoslovakia anymore now, it's the Czech Republic. Um, and the only thing I really knew about the Czech Republic was Bohemia Interactive were based from there, and all the women there are absolutely gorgeous. <laughs> oh, and it's a fantastic place to go for a, a winter holiday, apparently. Prague is a very, very popular holiday destination. Um, but none of that influenced why I picked the name Bohemian Eagle. It was simply um, a, a Windows Live username that was randomly assigned to me. Well, it, was a, it wasn't exactly randomly assigned to me. There was a whole bunch of random Windows Live usernames that were offered, and I thought, I like the sound of that one, um, and I picked it. And um, when it came to set a, time to set up a YouTube account, long before I was doing videos as the Mighty Jingles, uh, I just used the name, because it was a name that I'd been using on Windows Live already, and it was just easy for me to remember. So I hate to disappoint any of you Czech guys who are hoping that there's a, a deeper meaning behind why I chose the name Bohemian Eagle for YouTube, but unfortunately that's, that's all there is to it. Next question. Ezra Barson McLean wants to know, Jingles, how did you get into World of Tanks? Um, this is actually going to sound really, really disappointing. A lot like the old, why did you pick the name Bohemian Eagle? <laughs> because it, it literally, it was, I almost got into World of Tanks by accident. Um, I was on Facebook one day, and you know those really annoying adverts that pop up on the right side of the page when you're on Facebook that you just tend to ignore? Um, one day, I clicked on one of them. I don't know what possessed me to do it. I, I, I have never clicked on one of them before or since, but it just happened to be an advert for World of Tanks. And, um, and thus a legend was born. <laughs> Uh, it was literally as random and accidental as that. Uh, I hadn't heard a thing about World of Tanks before that. That's not strictly true. I'd heard things, um, you know, on shotgun, uh, on, on rock, paper, shotgun, and, and various different gaming news sites. And I thought, uh, an MMO with tanks? That's never going to catch on. Uh, and thought nothing more of it. And then I, purely by accident, clicked on a Facebook link uh, years later. Uh, and there it was. And that's that's how I got into World of Tanks. Next up, Dewey Pornstar, love the name by the way, uh, he wants to know, do I always make hot chick MMO characters? Uh, very, very surprised to hear that question, Dewey. Um, I don't know where you could have gotten that idea from. I mean, I, I can't imagine what I've done to ever give the impression that I only ever play fit birds. <laughs> you know, when I'm, when I'm playing my MMOs, uh, it's bizarre no idea what i did to give anybody that impression so um sorry don't know how to answer that one atomic fury 94 wants to know do you think there's a problem raging at noob teams even when you're not doing very good first things first raging at your team in chat usually means one thing more than anything else you're already dead because if you're not already dead, how do you have time to be raging at your team in chat? Right? Don't you have better things to do? You've got a noob team. Surely you should be working your ass off to try and save the game. Secondly, the only thing it achieves... Well, it achieves two things. One, it makes you feel slightly better about being dead. And two, it announces the fact that you're an arrogant douchebag to the rest of your team. And I have to hold my hand up here. Uh, you guys have all seen the evidence in the videos I've uploaded. I do it myself. I don't do it very often. Um, I certainly do it a lot less than I used to because of all the reasons that I've given. It doesn't achieve anything. It doesn't make you feel much better about yourself and it certainly doesn't make your team perform any better. 
And the thing is, uh, let's say let's say you do have some good advice to give to the team, and if they pay attention to your advice, they they might actually be able to swing the game around and and have a victory. They're a lot less inclined to listen to any good advice you might have to offer if you begin your advice giving session with the words, "Oh my God, you guys are noobs, you suck." You run the risk of making yourself look like a complete idiot yourself, because just because somebody is doing something that looks noobish to you doesn't necessarily mean it's the wrong thing to do. The example I'm thinking of, um, oh, it was a year, it was, well, a long time ago. Um, you know, they say a little knowledge is a dangerous thing, and that's certainly true in World of Tanks. I mean, when you start playing World of Tanks, you don't know a thing, but it doesn't matter because nobody else you're playing with knows a thing anyway. You're just rushing around derping each other in your little tier 2 and 3 tanks. It's great. But then you learn a little bit more about how the game works, and that little bit of knowledge that you have makes you dangerous because you assume that you know more about the game than you do. And I have been in situations where my own stupidity has gotten me killed early on. Um, and I'm watching what our top tier heavy, for example, is doing on the map. And he's actually driving away from where all the enemy tanks have been spotted. And <laughs> what are you doing, you noob? The fight's not over there. Oh, all right. And yeah, he's driving away from where all the enemy tanks have been spotted. But he's doing that not because of the tanks that have been spotted. He's doing it because of the tanks that haven't been spotted. And he's played the game more than me. And he knows, based on looking at the map and looking at the team list, if these enemy tanks are alive, and I can only see those enemy tanks there, nobody is covering this side, and I know exactly where the remaining undetected enemy tanks are going to be. And off he goes, like a rock star wins the game. It, you know, just because I didn't understand why he was doing what he did made me think he was a noob, when the noob was actually me. And I just made myself look like a complete idiot in chat. So, raging at your team in chat? You know, even when it's fully justified, even when you are on a team consisting of complete cock-end douchebags, it's just... It's just not worth it. It doesn't do anything other than make you feel slightly better about yourself for a couple of seconds. That's the only positive effect it has. It's not going to make the remaining members of your team suddenly start driving their tanks like General Heinz Guderian. Right? It's just announcing that you're an arrogant douchebag who's accepting no responsibility for the team's defeat. Um, and nobody's going to want to listen to you. Regardless of anything useful you might have to say after that point. So it, it's just not worth it. And I do need to take that advice to heart myself. But, you know, and I appreciate why people do it. You get angry. We're only human. But, it, you know, it's not big, it's not hard, and it's not clever. In my previous Mingles with Jingles video, I uh, showed off some of my Airsoft collection. And uh, in the comments to that video, uh, I mentioned that I had actually been busted by armed police. And straight away, there were... And there was a general clamouring for, oh, you must tell us about that one. And the one person who asked that got thumbed up the most was um, Killer Ace USAF. So for Killer Ace USAF, here we go. This is the story of what happened when I got raided by the police armed response team. I was serving on HMS Newcastle at the time. It was a Type 42 destroyer. And the ship was... I can't remember where the ship was. Uh, possibly on a South Atlantic patrol. I, I can't remember. Not important, but the point was that the ship was away. I was supposed to be on the ship, but I got sent back to the UK for a couple of weeks to attend some course or other. I can't even remember what it was. Not important. Um, but the course that I was attending um, only kept me busy during the week, and on the weekends, obviously, I was at home. So I did what I always did on the weekends back then, which was go airsofting. And uh, I would Obviously, you never carry these uh, replica weapons around in public, because that's just asking to get shot by police. So, um, I, I, you know, I, I always made sure these things were in gun bags, um, and I was responsible about it. I never, never got them out in public, and so on and so on and so on. However, I remember coming back from Combat South, where we played, um, and as I laid the guns out in the lounge, to clean and maintain them. And, and after I'd cleaned them, I left them there overnight and, and forgot about it. And, and 
and I hardly ever use the lounge. I was normally in my bedroom on the computer playing Star Wars Galaxies. That's how long ago it was, was playing Star Wars Galaxies. And so these guns were out in the lounge uh, on the sofa for a couple of days, but which wasn't a problem because th there's a big old fence all the way around the garden. And the only way you could see these guns, uh, or replica guns, would be if you were in the garden. So in order to see the weapons, you would have to be trespassing. But what I'd forgotten <laughs> was that because I was away for six months, I'd given the garden gate key to the next door neighbour. And the next door neighbour had said that they would look after the garden, they'd keep the, you know, the, the lawn mowed and, and so on and so on, they'd you know, do the weeding until I got back. And I'd totally forgotten, not only about that, but I'd totally forgotten to tell the next door neighbour that I was back for a few weeks in the middle of the six month deployment. So as far as the neighbour was concerned, the house was supposed to be empty. And what I can only assume must have happened was that I'd gotten back from Combat South on the Sunday, left all these guns out um, on the sofa in full view with anybody in the garden. The next day, Monday, the neighbour had come in on, with the key that I gave them. <laughs> Unlocked the garden gate, come in, started mowing the lawn, looked up, saw all of these M16s and M4s and G3s and God knows what else laid out in the lounge in a house that's supposed to be empty, shit their pants, and immediately done the responsible thing and phoned the police. And so that Monday night, um, I was <laughs> playing Star Wars Galaxies on the computer when I heard a knock at the door very very late at night and all I was wearing was uh, underwear and a, and a dressing gown a bathrobe and I went down and opened the door and and you know what this is um, there are a lot of differences between England and the USA <laughs> and um, and this is one of them because if this had happened in just about anywhere in the USA they wouldn't have knocked right they'd have just destroyed the front door breached and cleared <laughs> come charging in with a full tactical team and I would have been stunned, tasered, cuffed and, and, and dragged out um, within 15 seconds of them breaching the front door. But this is England, <laughs> so they knocked politely. <laughs> it sounds absurd, but actually, you know, they were very professional about it. They knocked, I went downstairs, opened the door, immediately had an MP5 shoved in my ear by a very, very polite... Um, armed and armoured police sergeant um, while an, another two MP5s were just trained on me uh, Good evening sir, Hampshire Constabulary Armed Police Response Unit uh, Can I just ask you to turn around and put your hands behind your back please? And I went, uh, yep, I think I know what this is about <laughs> Did exactly as I was asked Slapped the cuffs on me Can I just ask you sir, is there anybody else in the in the in, on the premises? Are you alone? I said, yep, absolutely alone You sure about that, are you sir? Yep, yep, nobody else here but me Okay, if I could just ask you to stand aside sir pushed me up against the wall police dog and handler went charging past cleared the house within 15 seconds confirmed that I was alone and then everybody started doing the police thing um, and it was very 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 polite and professional and, and English <laughs> it kind of reminded me of um, I don't know if you've seen that Simon Pegg movie Hot Fuzz but there's a scene in the movie where he's realised that what's going on in this sleepy English village and he tools himself up with shotguns and rifles and pistols and, and what he's just dripping in weapons. And, and it's just like a Hollywood action movie where he gets on the horse and he rides into the town square and he, and he faces off against all the people that he knows are you know, up to no good. And if it had been an American movie with an American cop right, covered in guns with all the bad guys facing him off in the town square, he would have said something like, uh, I came here to kick ass and chew bubblegum. And I'm all out of bubblegum. But it wasn't an American movie. It was an English movie. And so he just nodded and said, morning. <laughs> you know? And that's exactly, exactly what it was like. Anyway, obviously I hadn't done anything wrong. There were no real weapons in the house. And as soon as the police had satisfied themselves of this fact, um, the cuffs came off and they were very apologetic and professional about it. And it was fine, no problem, so uh, I made them a cup of tea, 
while uh, the detectives were finishing up their paperwork and the armed police were like, so let's uh, have a look at some of these weapons of yours. And I said, yeah, no problem, here you go. And I'm showing them around the collection. And when they caught their eyes on my MP5s, they were so jealous. <laughs> Because the thing about airsoft replicas is they're one-to-one scale replicas. So equipment and tactical accessories that fit on the real weapons will fit on the airsoft weapons. And my MP5 was tricked out (laughs) with the most Gucci kit that they just, you know, the Home Office would not pay for, for our police forces. So they were really jealous of, of the stuff that I had. So that's the story of how I got raided by the armed police. Actually, and I'm going slightly off topic here, it reminds me of um, a story that I've been meaning to tell you about, uh, and again, about the difference between the UK and the USA. Um, Over here in the UK, we just assume that all of you Americans are gun nuts. (laughs) We just assume you've all got your own private arsenal, you know, in your basement. Um, And I had a couple of American friends over from New Jersey several years ago. And the first, well, one of the first things that they said was they couldn't believe how safe they felt just wandering around Portsmouth and Gosport, you know, on the south coast of England. Um, just, you know, wandering around the streets at night, they, they did not feel threatened at all. So, you know, while we were on the subject of personal security, I, I, I broached the topic of Americans and guns, which is always a popular one. Uh, and I asked, you know, so is it true? Because, you know, everybody in Europe, and certainly in England, seems to believe the stereotype that Americans have just got guns coming out of the yin-yang. Um, you've all got your own private bloody arsenals. I mean, is this just bullshit or, or is it true? And the guys were like, oh, man, no, that's such bullshit. I don't know anybody who's got a gun, man. No, nah, just no way. It's it's just Hollywood TV bullshit through and through, man. Don't don't pay no attention to it. Ah, oh, okay, that's good to know because, you know, we just assume that you all go to sleep with a nine millimeter under your pillow. And he's like, what pistols? Oh, fuck yeah, man. We've all got pistols, but I don't know anybody who's got a gun. <laughs> and it's it's true what they say. Britain and the USA, two two countries separated by a common language. <laughs> Next question comes from Avery Philip AP58. He wants to know, Jingles, if there's ever a zombie apocalypse, what kind of gun should I be using? Now, I've actually read Max Brooks's World War Z, or if you're American, World War Z, so I'm, I've got this one covered. Okay, you want to pick something that fires on semi-automatic, is accurate, and has a plentiful supply of ammunition available. So you're looking at something like your granddad's Korean War era, M1 Garand, or M14. On the other hand, if you live in England, where guns don't grow on trees, you're kind of screwed. In that case, what you want to do is head for your very nearest stately home. Some place that's got big walls made out of solid stone, and is chock full of suits of armour and dirty great big swords. Jimmy Plays Minecraft wants to know, actually he's got two questions. First, Jingles, what's your favourite cheese? <laughs> and secondly, is this the strangest question you've ever been asked on YouTube? Well, first of all, that's not even close to being the strangest question I've ever been asked on YouTube. Just have a look through the comments of some of my previous videos, uh, and you probably won't have to look very far to find much, much stranger questions than that. My favourite cheese is Wensleydale. Those of you who have ever watched Wallace and Gromit will know what Wensleydale is. It's a, it's a very creamy, hard-fat cheese uh, from the Wensleydale County in England, and I think it's fantastic. I'll eat it on anything. I'll And while we're on the subject, I've been meaning to say this for a long time, okay? America, I love you, I think you're great, but seriously, cheese should not come in a squeeze tube, okay? You're doing it wrong. Alt96 wants to know, do you have any good World of Warcraft stories? I've got thousands of good World of Warcraft stories. I used to run a World of Warcraft blog, uh, quite a popular one. Uh, And here's one of the stories, and it's to do with uh, the Death Knights. Anybody who's played well, any MMO, Uh, there always seems to be one class in particular that seems to attract more than its fair share of idiots. And for a long time in World of Warcraft, it was hunters. Uh, And the reason is it's... Because of the nature of the way the hunter's game mechanics in World of Warcraft worked, it was a lot easier for a hunter to screw up in a catastrophic way that would cause a wipe of the group. Um, And so, a lot of hunters screwed up in catastrophic ways that caused the wipe of the group. And... And there was that, and there was also the fact that night elf hunters 
that there were so many, I swear, Orlando Bloom had so much to answer for. The second he strapped his pointy ears on in The Lord of the Rings, the amount of idiots playing night elf hunters in World of Warcraft whose names were some sort of variation of the word Legolas just increased exponentially. And they were all, without exception, total clowns who didn't have a clue how to play their class. Yeah, all you old World of Warcraft veterans are all nodding your heads going, yeah, I know exactly what you mean. Well, that all changed when the Wrath of the Lich King expansion came out and everybody was allowed to play Death Knights. And suddenly the Death Knight was the retard of the month class. And suddenly, practically overnight in World of Warcraft, the servers were flooded with idiot Death Knights who didn't have a clue how to play their class, who were all named some variation of the Lich King's name, Arthas. So, brings me on to the point of the story. So, one day... I'm uh, grinding out heroic dungeons on my dwarf hunter, Henriksen. And um, the dungeon finder popped up a group for me. I was like, yay, great. Didn't have to wait very long. That was quite easy. And I zoned into the dungeon. And my first indication that something wasn't quite right was when I zoned in to find one of the group was already dead. This death knight, who we'll call him, we'll call him Wilbur, he was lying around waiting to be resurrected, and everybody else was on varying degrees of low health. Now this usually means one or two things. Either they just narrowly avoided wiping with only one casualty, or everybody had died and they'd run back, except for, you know, the bottom-feeding scum who believe that healers exist purely to allow them to go and make coffee and read comics while they run back to res their lazy ass after wipes. See if you can guess which group this death knight belonged to. So, while everybody's getting up and ready uh, to continue on with the dungeon, I, I took the time to inspect young Wilbur's gear. Now, I don't want to bore you with all the technical details of, of how bad his gear was, um, because you, if you haven't played World of Warcraft, you're not going to understand a thing about the various technical mechanics of, of how to optimise your gear, right? and that's it's just going to bore you. So. What you have to realise is that his gear was not bad. Um, it wasn't spectacular, but it certainly wasn't crap. But it was all optimised the wrong way. It was the equivalent of, for example, trying to scout with artillery in World of Tanks. You know, loading up your Hummel and going, all right, I'm going to go spot. You know, it was, it was like that. It was the equivalent of loading up a bomber in War Thunder. Um and then go and hunting enemy fighters by trying to drop bombs on them. You know, that's it was that bad. He would have tanking gear with, with damage dealing or healing enchants on them. <laughs> and he would have DPS gear with tanking enchants on them. It just made no sense whatsoever. It was literally as if he just put a blindfold on, reached into a bag of gear, pulled out whatever he grabbed his hand on first and said, right, that's what I'm going to play with. Um, it was. It just made no sense whatsoever. It, I, I was actually horrified, <laughs> just horrified, to see how he'd enchanted, gemmed, and chosen the gear he was going to use. And at first, I thought, well, is he the tank? Because it it kind of sort of made sense. I mean, it was bad, but it sort of made sense if he was, you know, the tank, the guy whose job it was to hold the aggro from the monsters in the dungeon um, and, and and take the damage for the rest of the group. But there was a paladin sitting two feet away from him with twice as much health as he had, so clearly he wasn't the tank. What it was was just... He didn't have a fucking clue. <laughs> he, he didn't have clue number one. So, anyway, um, before I joined them, before the, the group finder had uh, found this group for me, they'd cleared up to the second boss, which was Prince Taldoran was the name of the boss. And anyway, we, we cleared this boss with um, young Wilbur doing a massive total of 350 damage per second throughout the fight. Um, you need to understand, right, that Death Knights, certainly early on in Wrath of the Lich King, were considered overpowered. Uh, it was ridiculously easy for certain Death Knight specs to just literally face roll their keyboard and do three and a half thousand damage per second. Wilbur did 350. 
So we get to the next part of the dungeon, uh, called the Befouled Terrace, and the tank had a bit of a derp moment, and he caused a wipe by jumping over the edge of uh, this terrace to take out a group of bad guys without A, telling him anybody, or B, waiting for the healer to get there. So he apologised, um, and everyone ran back to resurrect up, except for me, because I was a hunter, and hunters can do this thing called feign death, where it just drops all aggro, um, and they pretend they're dead, basically. So I didn't die. And um, and Wilbur, because, you know, remember, Wilbur thought that healers existed to run back and resurrect him while he read his comics. Once everybody got back and Wilbur had been rezzed, he instantly did a thing called Death Grip on the nearest patrol of bad guys, which literally grabs one of them from distance and drags him in towards the Death Knight <laughs> and puts us all into combat with the whole group of, of monsters. Now, you need to bear in mind a couple of things here. He's just that second been resurrected, so he's got 15% of his maximum health, and he dies instantly. Also, he's just been resurrected, so the healer only has about 15% of their mana. And if not for the Herculean efforts of this paladin tank, we would have wiped again right there. Now, normally at this point, you'd vote to kick this arsehole from the group. <laughs> But I wanted to finish this run with young Wilbur. I had a sort of sick, morbid fascination to see what he was going to do next. You know, it's like it's like when you've got a tooth that hurts. You know, you know you shouldn't poke at it, but you just can't resist it. I just wanted to see how bad he could be. Could he actually be this consistently bad all the way through? Or, or, or was he just having a couple of random dirt moments? <laughs> yeah, he really was that bad. Um... Again, just to put this sort of thing into perspective, remember that the most damage per second I ever saw him doing, and, and as a Death Knight, his job was to do damage. Um, and the most I ever saw him do was 350 damage per second in, in that dungeon. Right, and this was at level 80 in World of Warcraft. Um, now, my mage, Callie, back at level 70, doing a, a raid instance called Sunwell Plateau, the, the second boss in Sunwell Plateau was called Brutalis. And he was, he was a brick wall for raid progression, right? Every single member of DPS... Every, every single DPS class in your group had to be able to do at least 1,500 damage per second in order for your raid to get past Brutalis, right? We got past Brutalis. I was doing at least 1,500 damage per second six months earlier at level 70. Wilbur couldn't do better than 350 damage per second 10 levels higher <laughs> in Wrath of the Lich King in a heroic dungeon um, on the next boss he did 210 <laughs> damage per second it was just unbelievable I, I genuinely think right that Wilbur was one of two things either he was a very very young child and I'm talking seven or eight years old here or, and, and people use this word a lot on the internet, and it's quite cruel, and it's usually not appropriate. But in this case, I think he might have actually been mentally retarded. Now, this none of this actually occurred to me until much, much later. Um, at the time, I just thought he was hilariously bad. And you have to realise that nobody was actually being cruel to Wilbur, um, despite his catalogue of cock-ups. Um, it's not like you know, related back to one of the earlier questions asked in this episode of Mingles with Jingles. People were not raging at him uh, and calling him a noob. Um, because it was so late in Wrath of the Lich King expansion for World of Warcraft that nobody... W we could have we could have done it without him. <laughs> you, you, we didn't need him there. Everybody had such good gear that we, we didn't really require his presence. And so we could mostly now that we were prepared and we just knew that he was going to screw up everything he was asked to do we, we were prepared for it now and so it kind of livened up an otherwise dull you know dungeon grind just to see how we could compensate to his m massive ineptitude <laughs> and so we, we, we you know it, none of us were actually giving him a hard time we were just laughing our asses off at everything that he did, but not in a mean or vindictive way, which most groups would have actually done. So we, you know, we get to the last boss, and um, you know he's ooh, he did a massive total of two hundred and ten damage per second. It's actually going down <laughs> on the previous boss, and we wanted to see if he could top himself. Um, oh, and he didn't let us down. 
there are a couple of uh, mods in World of Warcraft that will give you a graphic display of how much damage everybody in your group is doing. And I still have the screenshot from the last boss fight with uh, young Wilbur in that dungeon group. Now, Death Knights have got an ability called um, uh, Army of the Dead. Uh, and basically what it does is it just summons a load of undead ghouls. And, and the ghouls are not there to cause damage, right? The damage that they do is trivial. Uh, they're there as a distraction. They just taunt everything around them. And, and they're there to basically soak up damage for a few seconds. Uh, and the Death Knight, while his ghouls are active, the Death Knight does more damage, right? So the ghouls are not there to do damage. They're there to make you do more damage and to distract the bad guys. Okay, here's the screenshot. Now, in a group of five people, one of whom was a tank and one of whom was a healer, right, with three DPS. In a group of five people, he didn't even come fifth. <laughs> he, he was so amazingly bad. He came eighth in a group of five people. He actually did less damage than his own army of the dead ghouls. He was that mind-bogglingly bad. That it was, it was, it was nothing short of legendarily bad. And I, I swear to God, I'm not making this up. I looked him up afterwards because there's a there's a service on the World of Warcraft website called the Armory where you can just look up any body playing the game, any character. And I looked, um, and I have changed his name, and he because you know I wanted to spare his blushes, but I, I know what his real name was, what his real character's name was anyway. And I looked him up on the World of Warcraft Armory, and I swear I'm not making this up. Right? <laughs> um, the, he was in a guild, and the guild that he was in. It's called the Special Guild. <laughs> and the really, really scary thing is, right, there is absolutely no reason why Wilbur can't be playing World of Tanks or War Thunder today. Sleep tight. <laughs> Final question of the day comes from Mr. Sin City Man, and he wants to know, Jingles, what sort of countries have you been to for an extended period of time? And he's not talking about... Uh, when I've been on a ship and we've, you know, gone to Crete for a couple of days or a weekend. So that rules out things like when I left the Navy, uh, I treated myself to a holiday in New York. Something I've always wanted to do. Um, I'd always kept joining ships just as they were coming back from New York. Or, or leaving ships just before they went to New York. I always wanted to go to America. Uh, and I've been to America twice, you know, the USA. Um... But it's always been under my own steam. Right? I've been to Louisiana, uh, and I've been to New York. Uh, Louisiana for a week, and New York for a week. The New York trip was my gift to myself, uh, my retirement gift when I left the Navy. I thought, right, 22 years in the Navy, never been to New York. So I fixed that, and I spent a week at the Peninsula Hotel on Fifth Avenue in Manhattan. That was nice. Uh, New York was fantastic. But... That was only a week. So we're looking at, well, when I was 12 years old in 1982, uh, we emigrated to South Africa. And I actually lived there for a year. And then we moved again to Swaziland, which is the last kingdom left in Africa. Um, achieved its independence from Great Britain, I think it was in 1968. Still part of the British Commonwealth. Uh, and Swaziland was fantastic. But uh, we had to go to boarding school in South Africa again um, because, well, the primary schools in Swaziland were very, very, very good. But the high schools weren't much cop. And most people, uh, certainly most of the emigrants, sent their children to the better schools in South Africa, certainly at high school level. And so that lasted three years, and that was amazing. Um, some of the best times of my life were between the ages of 12 and 16 when we lived in Africa. Um, although it wasn't without... It was at the height of apartheid. Uh, Nelson Mandela was still in prison. Um, you know, there was all sorts of trouble going on. But we were children. Uh, and we hadn't grown up there. So we didn't really understand. I mean, you knew that stuff was going on. But it, it, didn't, it didn't seem real somehow, if you know what I mean. And it's funny, the kind of things that you just get used to that you would hear uh, now and be horrified about. I'll give you an example. Now, now this is just something that you did. Well, you didn't think about it, it was just something that you learned to do uh, at the boarding school. Uh, if you lived on the ground floor of, uh, of the hostel where all the boarders lived, 
what you would do at night when you went to bed was uh, the rooms were very simple there would be um, if you can imagine there's a window in the middle and there's a there's a bookshelf with a desk and a chair in front of the window and then at either side of the bookshelf there is a bed so there was two boys in each room and what you would do when you went to bed at lights out was you would shut the curtains and then you would jam the curtains up against the wall up against the window frame with uh, the bookshelf and then you would jam the bookshelf up against the curtains with the table and you would wedge them in place with the back of the chair and the reason you did that was so if somebody threw a petrol bomb through the window it would bounce off the curtains uh, and the curtains would be set on fire but the, but the petrol bomb wouldn't explode inside the room and nobody thought that was weird 12 year old boys would do this before they went to sleep at night here's another one uh, I was 16, it was 1986, it was the year uh, that we left South Africa and returned to England. And 1986 was the 10th anniversary of the Soweto Uprising. And on the actual weekend of the 10 years to the date that the Soweto Uprising happened, there was there were riots all over South Africa. Um, 16 years old, didn't watch the news, didn't read newspapers, didn't know South African history, didn't have a clue what was going on. Um... But the thing that you have to remember, well, not remember because I haven't told you, but where the Borden School was located, it was in a town called Barberton in the Transvaal in South Africa, uh, which was the first place gold was discovered in South Africa in the Maconius Mountains. Uh, and also the first, the, lo the site of the very first stock exchange built in, in all of Africa. So there's that. Um, but you had the board, you had the school, the boarding school, the two rugby pitches, and then this, it was called the Donga. And basically it was like a jungle. And right on the other side of the donga was where all of the blacks lived. You know, Which meant that if anybody wanted to attack the boarding school, they would be on top of you with no warning whatsoever. Because they would just, you couldn't, you know, they came, they came through this donga and you would not know about it until they were already running across the rugby pitches. So we didn't realise... But on the grandstand overlooking the rugby pitch, there were police snipers with nice with night scopes, um, because there were power cuts all over the town. Right, the whole town was blacked out, and where and, and the teachers came around, and they gathered all the children together and they took them into the top floor of um, of the hostel in the big study hall, um, and we got candles and paraffin lamps out and. And they, they were giving us board games to play and stuff. And as we're looking out the windows, we're seeing fires. Just the, the, the horizon was lit up with fires. I'm like, what's going on out there? And the teachers were saying, oh, don't worry, don't worry. It's just the, um, it's the tobacco farmers are, are burning their fields ready for the next crops. And we're like, oh, really? You know, we believe this bullshit. <laughs> Unbelievably naive. And then something serious must have happened because the teachers called all of the boys they left all the girls in the study hall and they called all the boys out into the boys' side and in the dark, by candlelight, they were like, OK, boys, right, we know you boys have got all kinds of weapons hidden away in your lockers. You know, all these ninja stars that you've made, all these knives that you keep hidden. Go and get them. <laughs> and this is a teacher holding an assault rifle, right? Because every man in South Africa back then was a reserve member of the South African Army, the South African Defence Force, right? They, they, there was national service in South Africa and they all kept their own assault rifles. <laughs> so, and it was just utterly bizarre. There's all these teachers, you know, these English teachers and history teachers walking around with assault rifles telling us that all of these you know, you're there in metalwork class and, and when the teachers aren't looking, you're making knives and you're making ninja throwing stars and stuff. And they, and they were literally telling us, we think we're going to get attacked. Arm yourselves. Right? And we thought this was just a big adventure. <laughs> That's how stupid we were. So yeah, that was my childhood. The only other places I've really spent any length of time in would be the Falkland Islands. I've spent... Um, over a year in the Falklands in various positions. Uh, two six-month tours of duty down there, and then a couple of months down there on various ships. And the other place would be uh, Belgium. Um, spent a couple of months working at the nuclear targeting cell in the Strategic Headquarters Allied Powers Europe bunker <laughs> in, in Belgium. And I can't obviously talk too much about what I did there, but it was amusing for a number of reasons. Um, 
which you usually get whenever you're in the Royal Navy and, and you go anywhere else where there's lots of other people who aren't in the Royal Navy. My, my daily working uniform when I was over there was um, black shoes, black trousers, white shirt with bl black epaulets with my rank on them in gold and a white cap. Um, and the thing about most militaries is that um, if you're wearing anything in gold, you're an officer. And, and if you've got anything on your shoulder, you're an officer. Because if you think about it, um, you've got lance corporals, corporals, sergeants, staff sergeants, colour sergeants, what have you. And, and the higher up your arm your rank goes, the higher your rank. So one stripe, two stripes, three stripes, three stripes and a crown or, or whatever, you know, indicates your rank. So the higher up your arm your rank goes, the higher your rank is. Well, my rank was on my shoulder and it had gold on it. <laughs> But I wasn't an officer. And the amount of time I, I spent returning people's salutes, <laughs> purely because they didn't have a clue what I was. Um, and after the first week or so, you get so sick and tired of telling people of various other different nations, militaries, that no, 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 uh, don't salute me, I'm not an officer. And you're just wasting your time, because most of them don't speak English anyway. So it just became easier, just as you're walking around, just to somebody salutes you and you're like yep thank you and you salute them back and you just keep going but it was hilarious um <laughs> it's just one of those things that you get used to and that brings this week's episode of mingles with jingles to a close as always if you have any questions you'd like me to ask uh, to ask if you have any questions you'd like me to answer in next week's episode of mingles with jingles leave them in the comments of this video as always folks take care i'll catch you next time